Good morning. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Richard Baxter. His presentation today is Helping Pediatric Patients Thrive, Improved Feeding, Speaking, Breathing After Tongue Tie Release. You will find Dr. Baxter's, Baxter's full bio in the Journal of the American Laser Study Club on page 31. And it's my pleasure to introduce him because I got to meet him several years ago and um, helped with a chapter in his book. And let me tell you one personal note about Richard. He's up at all hours um, writing and pressing on, and he was just so great with that. So it's great to see him and hear him talk today. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. So good to see everyone. Uh, so as she said, I'm Richard Baxter. I'm a pediatric dentist. And today we're going to talk about helping pediatric patients thrive, improve feeding, speaking, and breathing after tongue tie releases. A few disclosures. I am the owner of the Alabama Tongue Tie Center in Birmingham, Alabama. I did write the book Tongue Tied with Lisa and several others who are in this room. Uh, we have an advanced live patient course at our office. I have an upcoming comprehensive online course called Tongue Tied Academy, uh, June 1st. And I have no interest in any dental or laser companies. I'm not you know, being paid to speak there uh, for them. Uh, here's my family. This is uh, from Thanksgiving time, but uh, it's my wife, Tara. She's holding Molly, who just turned 12 months, so she's just turned a year a couple weeks ago. And our girls, as they would tell you, are five and two-thirds. Um, <laughs> so they're twins. Uh, here's our dental office, uh, Shelby Pediatric Dentistry. Uh, we did mostly dentistry and some tongue ties on the side, and then getting more and more and more. And now I do mostly tongue ties with some dentistry on the side. So here's the tongue tie center. We added on four extra consult rooms uh, to hear mom's story, figure out what's going on, check the baby, check the child, sometimes check mom or whoever it is, uh, and then release uh, when indicated. So uh, here's the book Tongue Tied. You guys probably have a copy. They have some out there, I think, in the lobby too. Uh, so thank you for all your support for that. Thank you for those who contributed to it, several of whom are in the room right now. Um, it has been a bestseller on uh, Amazon and parenting babies and toddlers. Um, in speech pathology, pediatric dentistry, and here's our Tongue Tied Academy that's coming out uh, in June. So on this beautiful day, uh, which you probably won't see because you're inside all day, but that's okay, uh, we're gathered here for an important purpose. We'll be talking a lot, eating a lot, breathing, and hopefully getting some sleep too. And we take most of these things for granted. Uh, they happen automatically, so it seems, uh, unless you pause and think about your breathing and slow down and savor every bite while eating. However, there are many people around us, you may have seen them in the airport even, who struggle with these basic tasks. Uh, they may be mouth breathing, sleep deprived, ill-behaved children, and not just from spending a week at Disney, which will wreck anyone, uh, connected through Orlando. Uh, all these people around you start out as kids, and many habits and adaptations, so poor sleep, poor breathing, poor eating, also start during childhood. We want to help our patients thrive in these areas, and that needs to start in childhood in order to reach their fullest potential. There are many children, in fact, way too many children, who are not thriving, uh, and their families are seriously struggling too. Again, it's all around you. Uh, they are in your office, your child's sports team, maybe even your family. Um, it's so common, we almost think it's normal now, and intentionally or unintentionally, we put labels on these habits and worse, end up labeling the child. He's just a fussy baby. She's a lazy nurser. He has always been a terrible sleeper. He is so hyper. She is such a picky eater. She's quiet. Her siblings have to talk for her. He takes forever to eat and eats like a bird. While the reasons behind these com problems are complex, uh, every day I see children with one common cause of all these issues that is often not addressed, a restricted tongue. All children are fearfully and wonderfully made by God and deserve to th reach their fullest potential and thrive as much as possible, particularly if there's a relatively simple way to fix such a root cause issue that may be holding them back. Most of these labels we put on kids, unfortunately, end up following them into adolescence and even adulthood in one way or another. So this weekend, you're going to get a new perspective on many of these issues, and I'm so excited for you to be here. I'm especially excited if this is your first time here. Is this anyone's first time here or first time hearing about tongue ties? Awesome. That is great. Um, so let's dive right in. And a quick warning, you won't look at people the same way home through the airport. 
you will probably have fresh eyes in your practices and even with family members. So some of you are like, oh my gosh, this is my kid um, or my aunt or whoever. You'd be shocked that you never noticed these things before, but that's okay. That's why we're all here uh, to learn more and help our patients breathe and thrive. So I'm gonna start off some pearls, some tips, if you will. Uh, so if you remember nothing else, just remember to take this one slide to heart. We always work with a team approach. So by the time they've come to me, they've often seen uh, the, lact the lactation consultant or multiple, their pediatrician, their speech therapist, myofunctional therapist, and most of the time a body worker as well. So this whole presentation is from a release provider, so my perspective, uh, like many of you in this room. Um, patients that have come to us for a second, third, or sixth opinion uh, all tell us that no symptom list was reviewed, they were not able to share their story, no one examined the baby properly or the child properly. So why do we pick it up when four other providers missed it? Well, all di proper diagnoses start with a proper history. Okay, you have to figure out what's going on. Misdiagnosis comes from not listening and not examining fully. So we always listen to mom's story, or dad's, whoever's telling it, but often it's mom's, without interrupting, empathize with the mother, and then we review all symptoms systematically one by one. And I'll show you those lists we go through. Uh, then we take notes. Uh, we'll examine properly with gloves and tools as needed. So often we use a mouth prop for children, like two, three-year-olds, uh, they're uncooperative, so we don't lose a finger. Um, we don't use the groove director a whole lot. Um, keep in mind that symptoms and function are more important than appearance. So the appearance is highly variable. We're gonna talk about that too. We'll image all areas of concern with an intraoral camera. We'll discuss the findings, make a plan. Then we'll release fully and precisely if indicated or refer to a knowledgeable provider uh, if, if you're not sure um, at this point. Um, follow up at one week, minimum, and more often as needed. So, here's our form for breastfeeding and bottle feeding infants under 12 months old. It's all on one page. It has to be easy for parents and straightforward for providers. And so, we're going to go over the symptoms here in a second. Um, how many people use a form like this one? So, Dr. Kotlow created the first version of it. I added a few things that I was seeing, um, but it's like probably the greatest diagnostic tool created for tongue tie in infants. And if primary care providers used a form like this and actually took the time to lift the tongue instead of just have them stick their tongue out, uh, they would pick up 95% of the babies because so many families are struggling to get by and they come in and they check off like three quarters of the things on here. So it's like, okay, something's wrong. There's some problem. So the problems for babies are on top. You probably can't quite read them, but shallow latch at the breast, they fall asleep while eating, slide often on the nipple, colic or they cry a lot, reflux and spitting up, Clicking or smacking noises is a dead, dead giveaway. Gagging, choking, coughing. They're gassy. The parents will be like, he toots like a grown man. That's what they always say. Um, maybe it's just an Alabama thing, I don't know. But uh, Poor weight gain, but it doesn't have to be poor weight gain. They hiccup a lot and often in which is really interesting. Um, lip curls under when nursing or taking the bottle. Gumming or chewing the nipple. Passy falls out easily. Milk dribbles out of the mouth. Short sleeping, so they're feeding him constantly. Snoring, noisy breathing or mouth breathing. It feels like a full-time job just to feed the baby. They always say that too. That's the participation check mark. Everyone gets that one hardly. Um, they get frustrated at the breast or bottle. Uh, they take a long time to eat. And then uh, further down, it talks about the mom symptoms. So creased, flattened, blanched, lipstick shaped, blistered, bleeding nipples, um, terrible pain, but again, doesn't have to be painful. Sometimes it's not. Poor breast drainage, they're not getting all the milk out. Um, plug ducts, engorgement, mastitis, nipple thrush. Often they need a nipple shield to nurse. Uh, and then baby often prefers one side over the other. So um, for uh, 12 months and older, here's our form. This is a form that assesses the common symptoms in this population. And I'm sure all the other speakers this weekend will go over these in detail. So I'm just kind of hitting the highlights for you. Um, so it's really four domains. There's speech, feeding, sleep, and then other. And then we'll get a kind of history of what uh, they had as a baby. So speech issues is, um, again, and for speech, if you just focus on articulation, that's such a small piece of the puzzle. Uh, there's so much more than that. So if you get frustrated with communication, often they're shy. Uh, parents and other people have a hard time understanding them. Trouble speaking fast, getting words out, trouble with certain sounds. Uh, speech delay, stuttering, uh, speech therapy for a long time and with little progress mumbling and, quote, baby talk, because they're keeping their mouth closed uh, when they talk, or very small at distance, they keep their tongue still. Uh, feeding, frustration with eating, trouble transition to solid foods, they're slow eaters, small appetite, they eat like a bird, uh, they graze on food, uh, pack food in their cheeks like a chipmunk, uh, they're picky eaters, it's always meat and mashed potatoes. Not always, but often it's meat and mashed potatoes. Uh, choke or gag on foods, spit out foods, these parents say they have to do a Heimlich maneuver on their kids, um, sometimes several times. Trouble trying new foods. Sleep issues. 
sleep in weird positions, sleep restlessly, they're just kicking mom in the head while they're sleeping. Um, they wake up easily or often wet the bed uh, after it's normal age to do so. Uh, wakes up tired, not refreshed. They grind their teeth while sleeping, mouth breathing while sleeping, snoring and gasping for air. The other issues are neck or shoulder pain or tension, and a lot of these are adult issues, but it can still be in kids too. Uh, TMJ pain, clicking, popping, headaches, migraines, strong gag, mouth open, uh, tonsils or adenoids, reflux, ear tubes previously, hyperactivity, and constipation. We'll get to that one. Like, really? Like constipation? Like that's the other end of the GI tract. We'll talk about that. Um, so how do we examine? So if you examine wrong, you won't see it. Okay, um, the child is in the dental chair or an exam table. We often use the knee to knee position because we don't have dental chairs in our rooms, um, the consult rooms. We use two hands, so both index fingers and proper stabilization. So mom's got to be holding the uh, patient's hands typically. Um, sometimes we need a second assistant or a dad to help. Um, but this, this again, this is for like uncooperative two and three year olds. So for babies, it, it's pretty easy. Um, kind of stabilize their head with your palms too. It makes it easier. Come from behind, cradle the head. Don't try to look at them in the car seat or in mom's arms. You will miss it. Um, many people who say there is, quote, no tongue tie, they're not examining properly. They might use like a tongue depressor and barely lift it up and say, oh yeah, there's no tongue tie. And when they say that, they're saying there's no obvious to the tip tongue tie. Um, but again, if you don't use the right tools, there's a mouth prop, a malt mouth prop, um, you might lose a finger, so. Um, lip ties come in different shapes, sizes, and insertion points. Don't get hung up on if it's like a three or a four or a two or three. It's really, it's a spectrum of lip restriction. Uh, the key is what is the lip tie doing to the child? So the number doesn't matter nearly as much as the symptoms and function. So does it blanch when lifted? Uh, with moderate lifting, so I mean, obviously if you pull hard enough, you can make anything blanch practically. That one on the top left probably wouldn't, but um, does it cause distress to the child? How does it function? Does mom tell you it won't flip out well when nursing or bottle feeding? Um, here's the tongues. So again, you see how thick it is. Some are thick, some are thin, some are to the tip, some are further back. All these were causing problems though, even the one on the bottom right, which seems like there's nothing even there. Uh, so again, you won't see this with the tongue depressor or without gloves on. Um, what's interesting and highly unfortunate is that it seems that the most painful nursing comes from the least visible ties. Not always, but often. Um, the anterior ties do not seem to cause as much pain for mom uh, when nursing um, as the less visible posterior ties. And then people at, the, at our local hospital will literally tell the parents that, oh, it's all in your head, mom. That's what they'll say. Um, but what matters is, is the restricted fascia and there's limited elevation. So it's a spectrum. It doesn't matter where it inserts per se. What matters is, is it causing a problem for that baby and for that family? Um, for some kids, like a restriction like this, uh, if you just check a baby randomly at the hospital where they're born, and it looks like that, I would not release that because you don't know what's going to happen yet. So wait and see what happens with the symptoms. Um, so for some kids, this restriction won't cause any issues. For others, they'll really struggle. So, um, And here's a child, same thing. So you can look in there. Um, most people on this exam, if they just saw them on a hygiene visit, wouldn't say anything. They'd be like, oh, there's a fused N and O. And the teeth are turning a little bit, but you know that's pretty normal. We see that all the time. So it's not normal for the teeth to turn in like that. Um, and there is something going on there, but you have to pull back on it to see. So again, they check so many kids and hygiene visits, like, oh my gosh, like this is, you just watch when you get to practice. <laughs> um, here's for children. Again, symptoms and function are more important than the appearance. Elevation is more important than protrusion. So sticking your tongue out is the worst test to determine if there's a tie. There's hardly any correlation, it seems, between appearance and symptoms, as the one on the left had clear speech and very few reported symptoms. On the right, elevates the palate. That child was nonverbal. They're also autistic, but we released that tongue tie and the kids started talking, said mama for the first time at age 10. Um, so, and he also had poor sleep, poor eating, that kind of stuff. Um, for lip ties, so once a child has teeth, the reasons we perform the lip tie procedure is mainly for difficulty with oral hygiene, especially if cavities are present. So you can see the caries on the top left picture there. Um, you know, like parents will be like, oh, I can brush the sides of the teeth or the bottom teeth, but as soon as I try to brush the top teeth, the kid's fighting and it's a struggle every night to brush their teeth. So a 15, 20 second procedure to help that can make a big difference. We also re release for cosmetic reasons. So when they smile, you can't see their teeth at all. There's a large gap or daspa between the teeth. Um, how many of you were taught in school to wait until after ortho to release the lip tie? Anyone? Yeah, 
So a lot of you. Um, so that recommendation was based on one influential orthodontist opinion from 1972 before evidence-based dentistry. Um, so was there ever a study done to determine if scar tissue forms? No. I don't have time to talk about the pediatric dentistry guidelines and how they cite an article that cites the guidelines and then cites the article. It's a circular argument and doesn't make any sense. Um, so they, they have no good reason for this. Um, and so we have a paper coming out. Uh, Dr. Zaghi and I are working on this. But basically, um, the gist of it is the diastema closes when it's properly released. So if you just make a clip up there, cut the middle of the lip tie, it's not going to close. You have to get the whole thing out. Um, so we had 192 total patients that we did a lip tie on for 2015-2018 uh, that, um, that had teeth, so not counting babies, obviously. Uh, 109 of them came back for like a dental reason or hygiene visit, and had, we got a picture on them. We didn't just take pictures like the ones that closed. We took pictures of everyone that came back. Um, and then the gap closed in 107 out of 109 of them, so that's 98% of patients. Uh, 52 were with CO2, 57 with diode laser, 13 had permanent teeth, 96 with primary teeth. I work on the manuscript currently. but So you can see uh, this one, uh, that's a full release there of the lip tie. Here's one that closed up. Uh, so this is about a year later is the, the third picture there. Um, obviously, this child is not asleep, hence the off-axis photo. <laughs> um, that was at the diodes. That takes about a minute, minute and a half for a diode. Uh, with, that was the eye lace. Um, and then even later on, it closed even further. So no scar tissue there. And again, we have a, over 100 pictures just like this of the gap closing. Um, Here's another one. This is permanent teeth closing up. Um, anyway, so wait for the article to come out as we have more details on it. So we all have busy practices, whether it's a dental or medical office, and we need a good way to check our patients for this. Because again, the least visible ties can sometimes cause a whole lot of symptoms. So for a while, we just checked everyone in our office. And uh, we had them all fill out like a screening form that we came up with. Um, the last thing we want to do is laser everyone. Uh, we don't want to treat anyone unnecessarily. But we also don't want to let any kids fall through the cracks. Because I was 30 before I knew I had a tongue tie. I wish someone had done mine as a child or as a baby. Um, so really like the middle road. We don't want to under-treat, but we don't want to over-treat either. So this is a screening tool. Uh, quick and easy to implement. Combines symptoms, function, and parent desires. Uh, and it prevents treating with no issues. So the first step, we use the tongue range of motion ratio. Um, basically just having them elevate the tongue instead of uh, sticking the tongue out. Uh, they should be able to elevate close to the palate or all the way to the palate. If they lift halfway or less, it's significantly um, below average. It's uh, you know, restricted. If um, they can lift 3 quarters of the way, though, some of those people may still have a tongue restriction, and they may be compensating and lifting the floor of their mouth. And so this is the best quick and dirty test if you're like, on the streets of Fort Lauderdale or Delray Beach, and someone's like, do I have a tongue tie? Don't have them stick it out. Have them lift it up. Uh, second step, you call it the tongue restriction questionnaire. Um, basically, it's the top 15 issues instead of 50 issues that are on our other form. So this is quick and easy for them to fill out, um, and it'll give you a ballpark uh, estimate of how restricted they are uh, symptom-wise, and it'll also help you with um, like just basically having a conversation with the parent. That's all it's for. It's, at the bottom, it says referral recommended, so it's not saying treatment recommended. This is not like, yes, you have a tongue tie. It says, hey, we need to talk about this further, and we don't have 30 minutes to talk about this during your hygiene visit, which is like five minutes. Um, so current issues. And then also asks about how significantly do these issues impact quality of life. So sometimes they'll have several check marks, but it doesn't seem to be a huge factor for them, like not at all or somewhat. Um, sometimes a little bit of education needs to happen there. But uh, other times they'll say very significantly. This is like all we think about. We can't go out to eat at restaurants because he won't eat. Uh, and then further down, it says tongue elevation exam that you fill out. Um, and basically, that says referral. So we refer them to the tongue tie center, which is like our other practice next door. Um, so speech issues. We're going to talk about a little speech, feeding, and other related issues in some more depth now. So again, there's so many issues with speech, way more than just artic articulation. It's like some of the older articles, like Messner in 2002, uh, talk about they're saying articulation. But they have trouble with certain sounds. So alveolar sounds, S, Z, T, D, D L, and R. VR sounds, so G, K, and ing, like in sing. Palda all VR sounds, so S, H, and TH. Um, often they have speech delay, so if their tongue can't explore and attempt new sounds, they'll be slower to talk. It's not really a true speech delay. When these kids are misdiagnosed with speech delay, this is actually from a tongue tie. <clears throat> so all kids with, quote, speech delay should be checked and considered for a release, because even ones that don't look very significant have had, like, 30 new words in one week. It's crazy. And they had like 10 before. Um, 
trouble speaking clearly or quickly, stuttering, lisping, slurring words. Often they get real shy. So imagine if every time you spoke, someone said, what'd you say? What'd he say? You're just gonna stop talking. Um, Mark 7, 35, it's in the Bible. His ears were opened, the string of his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Mic drop. <laughs> it's in the Bible. Um, feeding and tongue ties. So it's a very complex process. So there's eight tongue muscles, uh, six cranial nerves, chewing and swallowing. This slide's from Autumn, who's speaking next. Um, gagging, packing, uh, food in their cheeks like a chipmunk. They spit out foods, they vomit, they'll swallow it whole. So they don't chew as much, and if it doesn't start the journey right, it won't end the journey right. So that's one of the reasons for constipation. Um, they refuse foods, they have poor weight gain. So they're like, oh, he's just always been small. It's like, well, he might have been small as a baby because of tongue tie, and now he's small because he hardly eats anything. Um, diet selectivity, so they're real picky, poor lip closure, it takes forever to eat, so they just graze on food. And that can actually lead to more cavities, because for cavities, it's the amount of time the teeth are touching sugar that's important. Um, so we had a case series come out a couple years ago. You can just Google like Baxter and Hughes, uh, speech and feeding improvements. Uh, it's called uh, in children after tongue tie release, uh, case series. So this is actually posterior tongue ties. It's the first time in literature um, uh, posterior tongue tie impacted uh, speech and then the first article even mentioning feeding and tongue ties. Um, so we did them all with the CO2 laser. All five had great results with speech, feeding, and sleep. Um, and it talks about some other stuff we don't have to talk, haven't talked about. Uh, but anyway, so other untreated tie consequences. Um, so they can be embarrassed with their speech. Bullying, interestingly, bullying can go both ways. So a person with a tongue tie can either be the aggressive uh, type because they're sleeping poorly, uh, leading to aggressive behavior, or they could be bullied themselves. Um, and it was funny because I don't watch that show, The Doctors, but like maybe a year ago or so, there was a segment on tongue tied, you'll see that, and they brought up the bullying thing. I was like, oh my gosh, like I should have seen that before. Um, but they can be the ones that are bullied, and parents will tell us this because they're, of their speech or the way they eat and stuff. Um, trouble swallowing, so again, small appetite, real slow and picky eating. They're underweight, poor growth, growth and development. Airway issues, so mouth breathing, poor oxygenation, snoring, poor sleep quality. Again, from the airway issues too, but leads to poor behavior. Quote, ADHD, which is really just sleep deprivation in most kids that are diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, teeth grinding, poor brain development. So by the time the child is age three, their brain is already 80% the size of an adult brain. By age five, it's 90% the size of an adult brain. So we really have to get to these kids early as possible. Uh, GI symptoms, reflux, and constipation. Uh, again, constipation, really? Uh, sorry, skip poor dental development, obviously. A high arch palate, tongue thrust, crowded teeth. So we had a, a few slides in here on constipation, but I don't have time, so I have, just have one. Um, she was 11 and a half years old, came to us. Um, if you saw this girl's uh, pictures on a hygiene visit, you wouldn't even think anything of it. You're like, oh, that's a normal uh, freedom. But she had uh, neck tension, um, headaches, tonsils, adenoids out previously. She's hyper uh, borderline ADD. Um, sleeps in weird positions, kicks and flails every night, wakes up tired, not refreshed, grinds her teeth. She says she's always tired and mouth breathes while sleeping. Um, she also bites her hair a lot, nails, and like the ties on her sweatshirt, which is pretty common for kids that have sleep deprivation. Um, but constipation, she said, we tried everything, Miralax every day, we're seeing a GI doctor, my bowels are pushing on a kidney and bladder, she's so constipated. Like, she's like, this would be a miracle if it helped with anything. Again, look at that, like, there's nothing there. But for her, she has so many symptoms, like, hey, like, it probably helped, um, but it's never a guarantee, we never guarantee it. Think she improved? Of course she did, or else I wouldn't show you. Um, but <laughs> just kidding. Um, but with all these symptoms, uh, for her, this is too tight. So you can see here, there's the lingual nerve. Don't hit that. That little white, white ribbon right there, don't hit that. There's the deep lingual vein that goes right next to it. Um, it's easier to see in like uh, adults and adolescents and stuff, but it's obviously still there in children too. So afterward, less constipation. She said four check marks on less constipation. She was funny too. She's like, strangely, yes. Um, she's very elated now, she said. Uh, I have less tummy problems. Um, so now she'll go two to three times a day, whereas before she's lucky if she went once or twice, uh, once, once a day, or sometimes it was once every two days. Uh, we had another child who was autistic. He went once a week, and they had to give him a suppository to get him to go once a week. Now he goes once a day or twice a day. It's crazy. So mainly it's because they're chewing better, but also because it releases that fascia, and then also the wave, so that goes like through your whole GI system, that swallow starts in the mouth. So like the peristaltic wave that goes down is interesting. I hadn't heard that before. That's cool. So three reasons why constipation helps. Uh, and then she said uh, feeding helps, sleep helped. Would you do it again? This is like one of our questions. Maybe, probably yes. And then she said, I don't think so. It hurts. Some people are hard to please, but 
anyway. Um, so here's our study. This is the first study to look at like, comprehensive effects of tongue ties on children, and it's prospective. Um, so speech, feeding, and sleep as reported by parents. Some say, well, that's subjective. Well, who knows the kid better than the parent? Um, and so please don't take pictures. It's not published yet, but uh, I'll share it with you. So we had 37 children. Again, this prospective. We didn't like just cherry pick the cases. Before we knew if they were going to prove or not, we said, okay, they're in the study. Significantly better speech, feeding, and sleep at one week and one month follow-up visits. Uh, we did use a pediatric sleep questionnaire, which is a validated sleep questionnaire. Uh, it was significantly better at one week and one month. And we sub submitted the manuscript. It's been three weeks now since I submitted it. They still haven't even assigned reviewers. So anyway, uh, it just research takes forever and it's frustrating. Um, so speech. So uh, the way to read this is problem indicated. So we had 37 total, uh, like for the first one. Frustration is communication. 18 said there was a problem uh, with frustration with communication. 15 of those 18 improved but 21 overall improved. Okay, so that means that like six of them didn't even realize they had the problem until it was fixed, right? It's like you put on glasses, you're like, oh my gosh, there's leaves on the trees. Like, but you didn't realize that before. That's just thought, like, that's how everyone sees. Um, so 16 had speech delay, eight saw improvement, so half. Uh, it's not every time a speech delay, but it's, it's still a lot. And 13 overall, so five more didn't realize their child was slow on saying words until they just started talking more or started, you know, uh, the kids will start babbling more too. This is less effort to talk. Feeding, so slow eating, 21 marked it, 16 of those saw improvement, but 18 overall improved. Picky eating, 28 marked it, 10 of those saw improvement, and 11 overall improved. Choking or gagging, 17 saw it as a problem before, 10 of those improved, 16 overall improved. Spitting out food, 17 marked it, 11 of those improved, and then 17 total stopped spitting out food. For sleep, kicking and restless sleeping, 32 out of 37 saw this one. 23 had improvements in restless sleep. Their child was sleeping sounder, sounder, moving less in their sleep, and 28 overall saw improvements. This is really good. That's an indicator of how deep the child is sleeping. Less bedwetting, seven marked it, five of those improved, and 10 total improvements. Five of the parents didn't even know their child could go through the night without a pull-up, without a wet pull-up. And they were just surprised, like, oh my gosh, he's dry now at night. Like, we didn't think that was possible. Teeth grinding improved, mouth breathing improved, snoring improved, feeling less tired during the day improved, waking up less often and sleeping deeper improved, even gasping for air saw some improvement. So eight marked it, three of those eight improved, but 11 overall. So it wasn't considered significant because of the low number. We did the stats based on the number that had, they'd had to have marked at first. Uh, for the pediatric sleep questionnaire, so a score of 0.33 or higher, so it's like seven and a half out of the 22 questions answered yes, as associated with um, OSA in children. After a proper tongue tie release at our office, they went from very high risk, so our baseline was 0.48. So about half the questions answered yes, down to low risk. So at one week after, went to 0.2. Uh, so four out of the yeah, questions yes, uh, out of 22 questions yes, and then at one month it was even lower, down to three questions yes. Um, so 0.14 was the ratio. So sleep improvement was measurable and lasting, and they reported improved daytime symptoms too. And we've seen some of these kids back from hygiene, because this was about a year or two ago that we did this, uh, 2018, 2019. And um, anyway, they're like still sleeping better too. So one month later, 89% had improved speech, 84% had improved solid feeding, 84% had improved sleep, 90% of the people were happy with it. So, I mean, there's still some that weren't happy. They're like, oh, it hurt, or it didn't work as well as we thought it could. So working with a myofunctional therapist, working with a speech therapist, a team approach will help get those numbers up. We only have one myofunctional therapist in the whole state of Alabama. We're currently training three of our hygienists uh, to, do, to do that as well. Um, so we can ensure that patients have access to myofunctional therapy locally. Uh, and the one was in our office, but she had a wait list. So like, it's, it's hard. And a lot of people come to us from three or four hours away. So like, they, they can't come every week for therapy. But anyway, so let's talk about the treatment we provide in order to get these results that we're just discussing. So what we do not do is a phrenotomy, which is a clip or a snip. It often does not resolve the problem. So that top left one was cut into the body of the tongue. Can y'all see that? They missed. Uh, so you have to go below that. Um, the other one was clipped as a baby, apparently. I don't see what they clipped, but that child's in ortho. She's 13, uh, so we released it fully. Basically what it does, it turns an anterior tie into a posterior tie in a lot of cases. And uh, again, don't get like, hung up on like, anterior versus posterior. At what point does that happen? Really just like, it's less visible is what that means. They clipped the lip, you can see. Uh, let's see if I have the arrow. Yeah, there's the arrow. There's the lip clip. Um, this one they clipped into the salivary glands, so don't do that. That's kind of tricky to fix. 
You have to go like above and come down. There's a little mucus eel. Okay, we see this like every day. <laughs> um, here's some more. You can see how thick it is though. So if you see that like really thick frenum, always ask, hey, has this been like clipped before? Or was it? And often they'll tell you they know. Sometimes they don't know. They just clipped it in the hospital and no one told them. And they bill out about $5,000, interestingly, at least in our area. Uh, so if you cut it halfway, it'll only work half the time and you'll only get half the benefits. But if you do it right, you almost always get some benefits, especially when combined with therapy. Uh, so that one on the top right there, uh, he's a friend of mine, he's 36, and uh, he's like, oh yeah, what are you working on? I was like, tongue tie stuff. He's like, oh, I, I had my clip as a baby, can you check mine? Sure. And I was like, whoa, still there. It does not stretch out, does not go away. Um, he sent me that e an email that night saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, the bottom right one, so I have a f follow up story on her. So here's uh, blown up. So we did hers in February of 2018. And uh, they cut through the salivary glands. They gave her like four openings to her Wharton's duct there. You can see that. It's kind of mangled. So we had to go above that and come down. It was real tricky. Uh, so we saw her 16 months later. Um, oh, here's her form. So like it was clipped and she still had all the issues. It didn't help. Afterward, not as frustrated, gets more milk, hold the passy better, more comfortable for mom, increased supply, but still choking a lot. This is at one week. So that sometimes takes a little bit. So we saw her back later. So she lived, even though someone cut through her salivary glands. It's like, don't worry, it is possible to live even if, you know, they do it wrong. Um, it's a joke, uh, but anyway. And here it is again. So like, sometimes like, oh my gosh, like they cut, like she's, so we get so like laser focused, pardon the pun, on like the, the free numb, but the, there's a child attached to it, obviously. Um, she, she did well, her tongue actually works really well. She didn't have no like saliva problems, um, but her lip tie was still big. So if you remember back, like it was really thick. I mean, look how thick that is. So if I was smart, like my friend Dr. Zaga here, I would have told them, this will probably be two stages. <laughs> like, it would take two times. Um, but we, we did it again for free form. Um, so hopefully we'll get some good gap closure there. But that was so thick, uh, it, it did come back. So uh, and notice under the tongue, so there's still a string. So often, like, they'll still have a string there. So don't go chasing the strings, right? Like, to try to make it disappear. It will almost always form a new string of some type. So really follow the symptoms more than the string. Um, so here's our nursing room and scale. I highly recommend having like a dedicated space for this. We used just an operatory uh, for a lot of time, um, but it wasn't very comfortable. So we got like a reclining rocker and that was my office. <laughs> I see the desk there. We just like took the computer away and I lost my office for a couple years. But um, now we have uh, four console rooms. So I got my office back. I know you are concerned. Um, so here's the, we use a swaddle me, a lap board from a specialized care company, a little gel donut uh, to hold the child's head still. The lap board is nice because it helps ma maintain their airway. Um, but if y'all want to like a list of all the stuff that we use and materials and all of our forms, it's on our website, tongue-tie-al, tongue-tie-al.com slash professionals. My father-in-law was like, who's Al? Anyway, we're in Alabama. Uh, so uh, for how do we do this? So where do you start? Now this is not enough information. Just go ahead and start doing this from just this lecture alone. Obviously get more training, but tension is the key, and then you'll ablate until you get a diamond shape. So uh, pull upward, start right at the lowest insertion point where it says start here, uh, and then go slowly, mesiodistally, uh, until you get to the vestibule. For the lingual, start in the middle. Um, do not start up here, like we saw that one clipped, and do not start right there. Start right in the middle, slowly side to side until you get a diamond shape. Now some people are like, why, why is there a diamond? Well, you don't make the diamond. A frenum is a triangular prism. So when a cut is made through a triangular prism, two triangles appear, forming a diamond shape. So cut horizontally, you will naturally get a diamond. Um, you do not want to hit the deep lingual vein. Um, if you do, do not try to ablate it all the way with your laser. Even I got like the diode out, try to do that. Don't do that, you'll get a mess. The best thing, just hold pressure for 10 or 15 minutes. Go back and like hold the baby with mom and have your assistant holding pressure. Because I did that twice. I didn't learn the first time, obviously. Uh, but I, it was like hold gauze, it's soaked. Hold gauze, three seconds, it's soaked. It's, it'll bleed that fast on you. And there's an artery there too, but, uh, and you might get paresthesia as well. So just be really careful. Um, try not to cut muscle or babies on, ki uh, on babies or kids. It hurts more, bleeds more, more risk of paresthesia. There's more complications the deeper you go. So take a course or um, for shooting adults, like the breathe course, uh, just be careful with, um, with kids and muscle. Um, all that to say, it can be done poorly. This was a bad release with the laser. I don't know who did this one, but it was on Facebook, of course, for all to see. Um, so just be careful. Uh, done with the diode, they use silver nitrate. We don't even have silver nitrate in the office. Um, 
significant pain, nursing strike, uh, just be careful. And there's like, I don't know how many people are in that tongue tie babies group now, like 100,000 probably. Um, so during the procedure, how do we do this? We have two assistants normally. I like having two assistants. One stabilizes the head either from front or behind. The other one will suction. If you can't get a second assistant or you have like one person working with you, um, you can get this thing called a plamp on Amazon. Quick funny story. I went to Home Depot and I was like, I need an adjustable clamp with like another clamp on the end to like hold the suction. And the guy's like, I have a chain. I'm like, no, that's not going to work. Uh, that's not helpful. So I checked Amazon. It was like 20 seconds. I found this thing. Uh, so it's for photography, uh, for like macro photography, for like holding flowers. But it works amazingly and it holds your high volume suction right there. So if you don't have a second assistant. For a couple years, we just like did it without suction, like breathing the plume. You don't want to do that. Um, it's probably like smoking cigarettes every time you do that. So make sure you have someone there suctioning. Um, we take before and after photos for charting, legal reasons, uh, for, to show the parents. So for education, uh, you have to have a laser and use sign. So follow all laser safety protocols. Everyone has eyewear. Um, some eyewear vendors here today. Uh, those are the light scaffold glasses we have on. So anyway, that's how we do it. Uh, people like to always know the settings. Uh, so these are settings we use. Um, basically, we keep it really simple. So it's 29 hertz, and then the duty cycle is set at 72.5% duty, and super pulse is turned off because you get less bleeding that way, um, and you get better hemostasis. Three watts, we start that for infant lip or for a child lip. These are our starting settings. Obviously, adjust as needed. Um, an uncooperative toddler will do the tongue on this setting. An adolescent or adult starting settings, those are our starting settings. Uh, for infant or child tongue starting setting, if it's a cooperative child, we'll do it 2 watts, uh, 29 hertz, so it's an average of 1.45 watts. Again, the lip is 2.1 watts. And then all you do to change that is just hit the up or the down arrow on the watts. So like during the procedure, it's real easy. Hit the button, and then you're good. Sometimes I'll have to bump it to 4 if it's like a really thick lip freedom on a child um, or like it's, uh, there's some scar tissue. But okay, here's, I'll pause that one. Um, so here is a 2-year-old. Again, we don't put them to sleep. We're not papoosing them. Uh, only topical jelly. The parents and they're holding the hands. We'll tell parents. It's all in how you like phrase it, how you tell them. But um, it's it's less traumatic to them than a shot. So it's about like a flu shot, meaning like they'll cry for a few minutes and they'll calm down. Um, and by the time they realize it's hurting, we're almost done. So here's a friend of mine. We did not use a tooth chair, so I got bit at the end of this one. Um, but anyway, I get bit all the time anyway. So you see how thick that is? His dad's an orthodontist. Didn't even know he had a tongue tie. Uh, you got to chase it back as you're going, hold it there, and there I get bit. Um, but anyway, it, uh, it worked out great. And then the stretches at home, that's the tricky part. So the procedure is easy because like, we have three assistants there. Like, we, we're, we're good. The parents there. Everyone has on laser safety glasses. Um, but when they get home, they have to do the exercise, and that's, that's tricky. So like, if I have a child asleep already for a dental rehab and I'm doing a phrenectomy, I will put sutures in. If they're older and will tolerate sutures, I will put sutures in. Or adult, I will suture. Um, no, just kidding. And so it doesn't always turn out that nicely um, or that quickly. So here's a three-year-old we did about two weeks ago, maybe last week. Um, I'm just trying to get another picture, another video for you. Tension is the key. You have to pull back with significant pressure uh, while lacing. Um, so for this one, it was so thick, it took multiple attempts. So we had to like do it and then lift up on it and then get like a better grip on the tongue. You see the movement there. Again, getting these videos is tricky because they move so much. but. Um, you can see how it's opening up there. There's still lots of fascia. We haven't touched the muscle yet. We're still in, that's all fascia or connective tissue. Get a little bit more tension there on the side. A little bit more on the side here. You see how it's opening up and pulling back? So again, I'm not like creating a diamond. I'm just going horizontally and the diamond opens on its own. Can y'all see that? Okay. Again, the child is obviously not asleep. Um, here is a, that's the same one. Okay, here's a four-week-old baby. Um, so we start right at the insertion point of the frenum. Use slow hand speed. We kind of circle around first. Uh, hold a tight tip to tissue distance of two to three millimeters. And then you have to kind of chase it because as you go, it'll get longer and farther away. So you have to follow it with your hand piece. Just maintain that distance till the vestibule. There it goes, and get that part at the top, otherwise you'll have a little tissue tag there when it heals up. So right there, get that too. Now it lifts up much better, less restricted. Um, a lot of posterior tongue ties, like this one, have a lip tie with them. Some to the tip anterior ties do not have a lip tie, it just depends. This one's just a few seconds. 
So took out the fascia there, left the muscle. That's plenty, and that baby improved significantly afterward. Now it's smooth, there's no speed bump afterward. Um, here's a three month old. Again, you have to film about five videos to get one good one. <laughs> um, so this one actually had a little bit of bleeding on the lip, but I was like, ah, that's helpful. So we actually filmed these in 4K and 60 frames per second with the new iPhone. But um, so again, rotating around, kind of go up and spent a tiny bit too much time right there. And so I hit the periosteum and then you get a little bit of bleeding. See how it's kind of oozing? It's not a fast bleed, so don't worry about that like on the lip. There's, uh, it's hard to mess up the lip. Um, unless you just kept going really far into the muscle like in the vestibule. But uh, so see, it's bleeding a little bit, so I'll get some gauze, dab it. There we go. And then find where it's coming from, and then defocus, which means pulling back a little bit, and then hit it, and then it'll stop. So here's the posterior, well this is kind of anterior tie. So again, it's like, it's halfway, so what is that? Is it anterior or posterior? It doesn't matter, it's causing problems for the baby. Um, so right there, just right in the middle, disappears, just a few seconds, run your finger over, make sure it's smooth, and then we're good. So, now that's it. People always ask like, how deep do you go? Take all the fascia until you reach the muscle and then stop, like make sure you are down, because um, uh, again, you don't want to take the muscle on the babies, they won't be able to nurse very well. Uh, also, the wider you go, the more likely it is to reattach. So um, here's one, uh, if it's not treated in childhood, these problems continue and they just change as adults, they don't stretch out or go away over time. So this lady works in a call center. She has issues with talking clearly. She gets tired when talking, doesn't open widely when speaking. She juts her jaw forward, which is terrible for her TMJ. She said it locks on her, locks closed. Locks of neck tension, shoulder pain, strong gag, reflux, tonsils out recently, trouble swallowing pills, sleep apnea. Her AHI was 13, she had a sleep study. Grinds teeth, snores, gasps for air. She's on a CPAP, but hates wearing it. You know what her chief complaint was? Kissing and intimacy, she said. So, um, that, like, for her, not, not like the sleep apnea that will take 10 years off your life. It was like, when I kiss, my tongue gets stuck between my bottom teeth. Okay. Um, and that hurts a lot and is like embarrassing for her. So this is actually on Valentine's Day. We had that nice heart-shaped tongue. Aww. Anyone else have any heart-shaped tongues on Valentine's Day? Yeah, okay. Anyway, um, so we sutured this one. But look at the ele elevation change, like totally different. And here's afterward. So less frustration with eating, less moving around, sleeping deeper, um, less sleeping with the mouth open, less snoring. Uh, she feels like she's sleeping deeper, less TMJ pain, hasn't locked up, uh, used to lock up all the time, it hasn't uh, locked at all, less neck tension, less reflux, um, I think she said she broke up with her, so like the, the whole like chief complaint issue went out the, anyway, <laughs> but so I got a video on this one too, you know, this is in 4K, apparently. So we'll start right in the middle. And I don't have time to stir the whole like suturing because uh, it takes a little bit and we have just a few minutes left. Um, but again, that's all fascia. That's all fascia right there. So we'll go further back. We have her do suction hold. We get some of the muscle too, but again, we're like running out of time. So I don't have time to stir the whole thing. But anyway, the point is there's tons of fascia because it's been thick like that for 33 years. Um, so aftercare, briefly, everyone else is gonna to touch on aftercare, I'm sure, too. So um, mom's nurse right away. It often can look like an infection or pus since it's white. They have increased drooling, Tylenol, and Motrin. One interesting thing, we dose it by weight. So if you give an 11-pound baby the same as a 6-pound baby, 1.25 mLs of Tylenol, it will not work well. So we do like 2.25 mLs of Tylenol. So you can calculate it out, uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram, uh, 10 to 15. Uh, skin to skin, ideally they're nursing. Often we'll have improvement the same day, very often. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, a day or two, um, but normally it's about three weeks fully to relearn how to eat. And um, I always call them that night, they have my cell phone. Uh, for infants, we do three weeks, four to six times a day. Really emphasize quality over quantity. Again, like the actual stretch is about five to 10 seconds. Uh, interesting thing we do is we show the parents before they leave, and then we have them put on gloves and do it right there. Otherwise they get home and they're like, I don't know, like they some have never put on gloves before, or they're just like not spatially, you know, they don't do all things with their hands, whatever it is, but it's, it really freaks them out. And they're like, I can't do this. So definitely have them do it in the office. Make sure you feel someone, dad or mom, or someone's gonna be responsible, it'll be done. So we see less reattachment that way. Uh, for toddlers to teens, we'll have parents stretch the wound two times a day for three weeks. 
minimum once a day if they're like biting and fighting really bad. Quality over quantity, you don't want to cause an oral aversion, obviously. For best results, work with the myofunctional therapist. Or encourage the child to perform exercises at least two times a day or as directed. Uh, if we see the patient back at a week, that's key. Even if they're several hours away, we'll say, well, we still need to see you back at a week. 90% of them have lost some degree of mobility, and they need a gentle but effective deeper stretch. So I was like, hey, we're going like, to lift this up, just like you guys are doing at home. It'll often open up some. You will have some red stuff for a few minutes. That's important. Just let them know beforehand, um, and then they're OK. It's like taking a scab off your knee. It'll smart for a second. It'll have some red stuff. Uh, it shouldn't be super sore later, but uh, and then get that mobility back. And that's for children or for uh, toddlers and stuff, and for uh, infants. So we have a few case uh, studies here. So we well, have lots of great cases I could share like from last year. I have like a PowerPoint running of like best cases from 2019. But these ones are just like our run of the mill cases from the last two weeks. So just to give you like a sample we see on a regular basis. So this is not like our best cases, just what we had. This is a 10 day old, had so many check marks, shallow latch, reflux, colic, spitting up, gassy, poor weight gain, milk leaking out, snoring, short sleeping, constantly eating. Mom had flattened nipples and seven out of 10, which is toe curling pain when nursing and had plug ducts. All of this from a thin lip tie and barely visible string under the tongue. So for this baby, these are too tight. But many babies have this appearance and have no symptoms, so they would have no treatment. A week later, those check marks are now all improvements. So on this form, all the check marks are good things. Deeper latch, less colic, less reflux, less spitting up, less hiccups. Again, they'll hiccup like excessively in utero. Then they're born and they hiccup all the time. We'll do the procedure and it stops. So it's related to dysfunctional swallow. So like, if they hiccup occasionally in the womb, that, like, yeah, that could be normal. Just like picky eating, like just picky eating, probably not a tongue tie. Like it could be behavioral. But it's like picky eating plus this, 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 it, it, your suspicion. After a certain while, like, it's not a coincidence anymore. Um, now pain is a one or a two instead of a seven. Sleeping longer, baby's less frustrated, getting more milk, gained a pound in a week. So normal weight gain is seven ounces, an ounce a day. Mom said, thank you, this has helped us so much. Now it's actually referred to as by a pediatrician. I'm like, yes, like we're getting to them a little bit, working on it. I know some of y'all share those same struggles. This three-week-old was uh, clipped in the hospital, still had severe struggles, so all those check marks are struggles. Again, if they had a form like this, the pediatrician like, oh yeah, something's clearly going on here. If he's a preemie nipple, excessive hiccups it, all the time in utero, trouble bottle feeding, snoring, mom has seven out of 10, sometimes 10 out of 10 pain, like she's cutting off her arm. A lot of these moms say, I'd rather be in labor than nurse this baby every time. She, she said, I honestly dread feeding him. That was her quote. You shouldn't have to feel that way about your baby. That's not right. Thin lip tie, but look, they cut right by the glands. They missed the salivary ducts, but right there. And so we had to go above that. A week later, deeper latch, less clicking, less gagging, better weight gain, less milk leaking out. Pain went from a seven to a two, less nipple damage. Mom can tell he's getting much more milk. Four month old. So it weighs 11 pounds, 12 ounces. So that's way too small. Like our daughter Molly was up four pounds to the same weight by four weeks old. And this is a four month old. Now Molly was like, she's chunky. Like she had rubber bands going up. She's a year old now. She's thinning out when she started running. But anyway, so this lady, she checked almost every single box. It's a huge ordeal just to feed her. She had a feeding tube, seen a neurologist, a feeding therapist. They said she has a fat malabsorption problem and reflux. Those are her problems, they said. Um, so they put her on Zantac which has been recalled, has NDMA, a cancer-causing substance. Um, she had an ultrasound for pyloric stenosis. Mom has to carry seven outfits with her. So basically like an outfit per feeding uh, because she's always throwing up her milk and no one can figure out what's wrong. The daycare worker who cares for her has been feeding babies for 30 years, said this is the hardest baby she's ever had to feed. So again, like, what is going on? Like last ditch effort, come see us four months later. It works better when it's done in the first week. The Hail Mary, like, it doesn't work as well. Like, sometimes they catch the Hail Mary, sometimes they don't. But we've had babies get back to breast even after, like, eight months of pumping. So it is possible, but it's not as easy. Uh, a week later, she gained eight and a half ounces. That's before she ate, so mom hadn't even fed her yet. She was already eight and a half ounces up from previously. Um, so we should just wait until after she fed her, and then she'd be up 12. But uh, latching deeper to the bottle, sleeping with her mouth closed, less snoring, less milk dropping out. She's even babbling more. Uh, which she wasn't hardly making any noises before. I'm oh, sorry, there's the form to show I'm not making this up. Um, anyway, yes, she was failure to thrive and uh, helped her out significantly. Two-year-old boy uh, had issues as a baby, was severely underweight. No one realized there was a problem as a baby. So he got bigger and now struggles with speech, feeding, and sleep. He's in the first percentile. I was going to say one 
because anyway, my daughter Noelle says once sometimes, it's so cute. Um, first percentile for weight. Uh, mom has had to do the Heimlich twice for him. He chokes, struggles with meat, barely eats any food. When he does, it's very slow. It's so much effort to eat. So again, like you don't realize it's hard for them to eat because like they don't know any different. So here it is. There's like nothing there. I mean, if you saw that kid on hygiene, you wouldn't even ask about the tongue. So that's why like it's helpful to screen these kids and just try to see because otherwise they th she would have checked off every box. A week later, now he eats two bowls of cereal. Before he would barely have one, have like half a bowl. Eating faster, eating more, less choking. Speech-wise, had new words. His words are more clear. He responds and tries to say new words. He was getting to the point where he wasn't even trying because he knew he couldn't. Sleeping longer, he used to wake up at 6 a.m. Now he sleeps until eight or nine o'clock. No more dark circles under his eyes. These are objective things. Sleeping deeper, because, he's, because of that, he's less easily distracted and he follows commands better. How many of the kids are just like him, have had labels put on them, he's just a terrible sleeper, he's just small for his age, he just eats like a bird, he's easily distracted. I mean, look how many issues saw improvement in only a week, it's crazy. Uh, Three-year-old, his main issue is speech, he has around 30 words, should be about 100. He tries to say words, they come out jumbled. Mom nursed him for 13 months with seemingly no issues, so sometimes it doesn't cause a lot of issues and then it rears its head later. Restless sleeper wakes easily, weird positions. Uh, again, these are all cases we saw in the last two weeks has a medium appearance. Um, so if you just look in there, you wouldn't see it, but then pull back on it, you can see it's much tighter. Um, no issues with his lips, so don't just laser everything. Just because there's a freedom there, don't just laser it, okay? Um, it's easy to brush his teeth, so just leave it alone. He got some speech improvements at a week with easier to make sounds in five or 10 new words. Now he's actually making sentences. Feeding didn't improve yet, but his parents were still very happy. So you never know what you're gonna get. Sometimes you get, like we'll say, hey, maybe we get sleep and speech. Maybe we'll get sleep and feeding. Like, maybe we'll just get feeding. Uh, we, we don't know, it just depends. But sometimes the feeding and sleep take longer. It, it just, it, there's no sleep therapy. Like, there's feeding therapy, speech therapy, but anyway. So here's a three and a half year old. This is literally the very next patient we saw after that one. Um, t this is last week. Tons of speech issues. He's three and a half, he has six words. Okay, I'm not a speech therapist, but that, that's a problem, okay? Um, Tons of speech issues. Been in therapy for a year. As a baby, he can only breastfeed for a week. It was so painful. It was colicky. They put him on Zantac. His two-year-old sister eats more than he does, and he's three and a half. He's always the last one to finish his meals. It's more effort for him to eat. He's picky with meat, sleeps restlessly. He's a light sleeper with his mouth open and snores. He's irritable and melts down often. Mouth breathes during the day and had his huge tonsils removed, mom said. So this is a common case we see. I mean, that's pretty tight to me, but again, like if he sticks out his tongue, like it'll come down. Mm a little bit, like, but if you lift up the tongue, like, okay, that's too tight. But again, if without tension, look how tight it is. Not that obvious. Again, lip tie, he has a slight gap there, but that's normal spacing up there for his age. Um, it's actually inserting, it's like a class two, so I'll just leave it alone. We didn't touch it. Um, with proper examination, lifting from both sides, very significant. So look at the elevation change between uh, the, one, the third one and the fourth picture there. It's a huge difference. <clears throat> Think got better? So at a week, um, he had 10 new words. Before, he only had two to three words. So he said, like, uh, I think, night-night, Zach said, love you. He's putting two words together now. Um, they saw no difference with feeding and sleep. What's interesting is, though, they put no prior issues on feeding and sleep. So, like, we saw the before form. It was all marked up. But for them, they didn't perceive it as a problem, problem really. Um, they said he's also mouth-breathing less, so... Hopefully in a good week, so we'll see some good cha changes with feeding and sleep too. But for these kids, the release just gives them the ability to move their tongue, and then they need therapy to rehabilitate and see the good gains and lasting improvements. So some takeaways. Proper assessment and evaluation is critical. Symptoms and function are more important than appearance. Screening should really be conducted just, I would just do it on everyone for like a six month period to get all the patients and then just on new patients as they come in. Um, the sooner the problem is addressed and the more team members, the better. And keep in mind that these issues can last a lifetime and place limitations on a patient and a family's quality of life. And that's all I have. And if you want to download the forms and materials, they're on our website, and the Tongue Tide Academy is coming June 1st. Thank you. <laughs> questions or no? Time for a couple questions. If anyone has a question on something, there might be a microphone where you just yell it out. The bottom, like the base of it, 
So if I do, it would be like a second release. So I wouldn't do it at the same time because then when they're doing the stretches, only the top, the spire of the Eiffel Tower would open and the base wouldn't because the, oh, sorry, only the base would open and the, like the main part you want to open wouldn't. Does that make sense? So you put tension on it and then you, this part's held by the alveolar ridge, the base is, so that part will open up, but then the top part won't open as much. It's really tricky if you have two wounds down there. So we just do one almost always. Yeah, typically. And again, if, if they still need it later, then we'll go back and do it. But I like to only have one wound at a time that they can focus on. That's just us, though. There's different opinions. Um, can you talk about how you know when you're through the fashion and add the muscle? What are the things that you're looking for to tell, okay, I'm through the fashion, I'm adding muscle down? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the question was, um, how can you tell when you're through the fashion at the muscle? You use your finger and kind of just massage down there and check it, but then you'll see it's red. And then if you hit the, the muscle with your laser, it'll kind of streak, makes a little like yellowish, whitish streaking, and you can see it kind of pop up. And so you can tell when you're there. Um, in this video here, towards the end, we start doing a little bit of muscle. You can see the difference. So again, this, that's some of the muscle right there. We didn't watch this whole thing as a time, but there's a little bit of fascia there. So the fascia looks white and like spider webby, and the muscle looks like, I mean, like a steak. So a suction hole. See, that's the muscle right there. Can you see that red? See, it's like beefy. And when you hit the muscle, watch, see it streaks like that, and it pulls apart, so there's so much tension. Can you tell the difference? Whereas the fascia is just like this. So sometimes you'll think you're down all the way, but you're not. So that's why I say go down until you get to the muscle. Any other questions? One more question? Right there in the... Suturing? Yeah, yeah, so we use 4 chromic gut suturing. Um, we close it up, it's like on this one, again, we closed it, it was probably like seven or eight. Um, we do one in the middle, and then one halfway, one halfway, and then kind of go up like that. But we do it in adolescence, if they'll let us. Sometimes they won't, uh, almost all adults, if they're asleep at the hospital already. I won't put them to sleep for just a phrenectomy. Um, we'll do even like autistic nine-year-olds in the office. Uh, but again, those ones have a higher chance of reattaching. So we only do that if they're like under for already for like a dental rehab. Like a three-year-old and have to do 14 crowns on, like we'll do their tongue tie at the same time and suture that because they're there because of poor compliance their uh, poor behavior, that kind of stuff, so we'll suture them. And it's easily accessible. But again, I don't have a lot of OR time. We can only go twice a month, so if you have more OR time, then I can see, or, or some people have like in-office GA, that could be helpful. But it's an added cost to the parent. And then I had a patient almost die uh, from uh, malignant hyperthermia, so like, I'm not just gonna put people to, that, that changes how you're like, okay, risk versus benefit for general anesthesia. So he lived, uh, he was in the PICU for five days, and actually a tongue tie saved his life. Mom asked me right before, real quick, mom asked me right before if I could do his tongue tie. I said, sure, what problems are you having? Speech, feeding, sleep, okay, we did it. So it was at the end of the case, they realized he was having a reaction to the anesthetic. His temp spiked, his CO2 went crazy, and then they're like, we have a suspected MH of the walkie-talkie. Within 30 seconds, they had like literally 30 people with bags of ice. And they're like, you better hurry up. So I was like popping the crowns on real fast, and I just stepped back and prayed. That's the only thing I could do. And um, he made it, but it was, it was really scary. But the tongue tie saved his life because if we hadn't done the tongue tie and sutured up, which took about 10, 15 minutes, he would have been in recovery, not intubated, not really well monitored, like on five minute blood pressure and a pulse ox. And they probably would have not been able to save his life because he was already uh, intubated and stuff. So anyway, yep. So I'm careful with GA like that. That's it. And then find me afterward if you have another question too. But thanks so much.